Hey there folks, Cozzy here for Pick One Pack One, and I am joined with Cloud and Page. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, and this is a unique video that we're going to be doing today. Uh, we decided that with the Jex Trail campaign coming out, that we'd spend a little bit of time uh, taking a look at the cards, evaluating them, as though these were about to be uh, released into the draft environment. Now, I'm willing to acknowledge that we don't know whether these cards are ever going to be released uh, into Limited. This may well be something that is for Constructed only, but we thought that it would be beneficial because it's a way of practicing our card analysis skills and see how we go with that. And there's definitely a precedent set. I mean, you saw the Varus Favor set go through. There were the four cards that came out through that, and they are now starting to show up in packs. So there is a chance that the Jex Bounty cards will pop in. Yeah, so we're going to be taking a look through. Uh, we're going to be starting off with the uncommon cards first. And the reason why is because in the hypothetical world where this is actually applied in a limited environment, then the cards that you're going to be seeing most likely, the cards that are going to be impacting your build the most, are going to be those that are the uncommon cards. The rares you're never guaranteed to open. And so these will be the, the meat and potatoes of what you'll be seeing. And then we'll go through the rares afterwards. Um, it'll, it'll be relatively quick in comparison. But yeah we thought this would be a fun thought experiment. Mm, absolutely. It's just one of those interesting things when new cards come in and how they shake things up. So, Cozzy, let's start us off with Quarry. Okay, so Quarry, two-cost card. Uh, draw one card of the top two cards from your deck and reduce its cost by one, and discard the other. I think this is an interesting card. Uh, it's basically card selection uh, rather than card advantage. So you're paying two and a card to look at two, but you only get to keep one. So there's no intrinsic advantage there. And for the cost of the two that you pay, it's reducing the cost of one of your cards by one, so it's saving you some of the cost. I think uh, probably the best card to compare it to would be Scheme, which is an appropriate card to play in Limited. It's not one that you're stoked to be playing, but if you're desperate for draw, then you're happy with it. And the other bit that's interesting about this card is the fact that it's in Fire as well as Shadow. It's one of those cards where I feel as though it will be somewhere in the late 20s, in my deck. <laughs> It'll be one where yeah. if it comes through very late in a pack and I'm already committed to those colours, I could contemplate it. And it's also interesting to consider that in Stone Scar colours, card draw is not something you normally have a lot, or card selection rather, is not something you normally have a lot of access to. Where do mm. you stand on Look, Corey? I'm I'm possibly overrating at the moment. It's one of those cards that I think I'd be very excited to play. Um, you're right, I definitely agree. Somewhere around the 20 type of mark is where you want to be putting it in but it's it's a card that's can tripping so it means you're playing it and instantly drawing something else you're looking at the top two so potentially in the late game it's coming in in a really nice way so that you're potentially at least skipping a power draw when you're there at nine power dear god i need something other than another power oh look another power here you go oh look it could be another power or it could be card x on top of that card x now has its cost reduced sometimes that'll be fantastic sometimes it'll be exactly what you need when you don't have a four drop you play it on turn four draw a relevant three drop and the three drops are two drop and away you go if you've got a very low curve you could actually end up drawing one power cards that you can then instantly throw out for free afterwards if you've got a very low curve aggressive stone scar deck i think this could be a really nice way of just powering out if you've got things like multiple only ronin in your deck if you've got even things like grenadine drones you're just throwing it out to the field for free while moving through your deck and making sure you're getting to the cards that you really want to be hitting later on in the game. Um, as I said, this is possibly me overvaluing it, um, but I think it's going to surprise me. I think it's going to be a, a nice card to have in the deck. Probably not more than a one or two of, but yeah, I'd be pleasantly surprised to have it in my deck. Yeah, I definitely never want more than two. I think um, this actually works out well, us talking together, because I think you have the optimist side of the coin <laughs> cupboard, and I'm definitely much more on the back foot. I can imagine times where I'm going to be quarrying for two sigils. And I'll be so happy <laughs> to reduce the cost of my sigil by one. And that I spent a whole card to do so. Uh, and that is a realistic flaw that could happen with this card. And it's, it's one of those things that will temper my enthusiasm, at least until I get proven wrong. Uh, I would I say, though, even with that as a flaw, if you're like at the absolute floor of the card, if you've cast Quarry, and yes, okay, you're missing out on the cost reduction, but then you're at least going, I am making sure that next turn in my draw step, I am not drawing these two power sigils that were sitting on top going to taunt me for the next two turns in a row. Yep. You're, you're at least clearing through the garbage and getting through to the cards that you're after. I think it's fair. And the one last thing that's worth keeping in mind with this is that it's just a spell. It's not a fast spell. So unlike other yeah. cantrips such as Levitate, where when you get to the end of your opponent's turn and if you have power up and you're just desperate to see something new, you can use it and then have your fresh power, uh, this will cost you... Have an opportunity 
opportunity cost on your turn. Uh, so I imagine... I'm not normally a fan of ranking scales. I feel as though they become quite arbitrary. But I think this is the kind of thing where I'll be putting in the low C range, uh, a C minus. It's the kind of card that if it's coming through in a pack somewhere between 9th and 12th, I'll be happy to pick it up, but I don't think I'll be going out of my way for it. Yeah, for, for all my optimistic talk, I would say maybe a C plus. So we're on the opposite end of the Whoa. scale, but we're still in that C kind of range. Okay, yeah. Um, so a little bit of space in between us. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's going to be fun to see what kind of card draw benefits uh, Stone Sky yeah. can reap out of this. Absolutely, it's nice for something new to be coming in, but. Going into a colour that's all about card draw, we've got Cliffside Porter, which is a one cost zero one with Echo. So it's two for the price of one. Hurrah! But I look at this card and I think it's waiting to be abused. There are definitely some decks that could abuse it. It's a card that you could potentially be thinking to draw if you've got those build around pieces, but I'm just not impressed. It's, hey, I've got two chump blockers if I desperately need to stabilise the board. But if I'm at a point in time where I'm desperately begging for a one-cost, two chump blockers, I'm in a pretty dire situation already. I'm not impressed by this. I think this card's probably got more of a ceiling in something like Constructed. But in Limited, I'm rarely going to be wanting to pick this. Yeah, I'm low on the card. Uh, two pokes in the eye for the price of one. <laughs> I'm not in for that deal. Uh, oh, we've talked about it before in the Draft 101. One drops are seldom worth it in Limited because they can get overwhelmed so quickly. Having two zero ones when your opponent has a 2-2, you can't even trade off like you can with Grenadine Drone. Um, I think the only scenario where I can see this having value, and this is me being exceptionally generous, I'm not trying to suggest that this has a value that will entice me, but when you're in Echo decks, when you're looking at Second Sight where you want to discard a card for your card draw, and you can draw these Echo cards that give you half a card to discard, so Second Sight can start to get bumped up into card advantage rather than card selection, then plausibly it has some value there, but I don't think that's actually value in the card. That's yeah. me putting on my optimistic hat and going off to magical Christmas land. And if that's the best I can find, then Santa's a very miserly uh, person to Oh, look, to if, join you're in in, December. if you're going into magical Christmas land, let's go um, <laughs> deranged Carnomancer, and suddenly we're getting two different creatures for five fives, but it's. You're deluding yourself if you're thinking that. It's, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, and I'm not actually trying to bona fide believe this. And I think these are the Absolutely. scenarios where if you happen to be lucky enough to have the ludicrous draft of a pair of deranged dynamances, you've probably got better cards in the rest of your deck because Primal was probably achingly open, but that's some of these scenarios where you might just be able to justify. But to be honest, I would argue that in 95 cases out of 100, probably even closer up to 98 or 99, it's probably a mistake to include the poor old porter. Absolutely. Oh, I don't know, man. I'm wanting Magical Christmas Land. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw this card. I'm going to play multiple crowns of possibility, and it's going to come out with <laughs> Flying Charge, War Cry, and not be able to take advantage of oh, any of them. please don't bring up Crown of Possibility. I'm scarred <laughs> from the last two times I've played it. Let's move on to something else. So we're looking at Hone now. Uh, it's five and green, uh, where you have a choice. And choices are great in Limited because you always get to pick what's best for you. You can either have a 3-3 three, three Relic Weapon or give your current Relic Weapon plus 3. Plus 3. Clouded, where do you stand on this? Honestly, I'm... Again, I'm probably overvaluing this, but I'm really liking this card. Look, if you're lucky enough to have been collecting weapons, you're in the right kind of colours anyway. You're in the colours for Mithril Mace, or Rune Hammer, Splash in some red, you're going Ricardo, you've got the sort of Akaria. If you've got any of those on the field, like again, my mind's probably going to Magical Christmas Land again, but looking at something like Sword of Akaria in play, you then cast Hone, and your 3-2 weapon becomes a 6-5 weapon, I'm in a happy place. Regardless of which, if you don't have that, Sword of Akaria on its own is a good card. This is a bit more expensive, and that expense is given to you for the upside of choice, but just being able to play a 3-3 three, three relic, relic weapon, it's not quite getting to that magical 4 toughness that you're after, but it's still that 3 points of damage, it's a torch, it's a removal spell, and then of course if you've got a, a chance of having ways of recurring those relic weapons, it does put a 3-3 three, three relic weapon into your void. So you've got ways of using it again. I think the card's potentially going to cause some nice blowouts. I definitely think that um, the ceiling is there, but uh, again, I think going I'm going to be the on the floor. side. I'm taking down the tinsel, I'm putting away the decorations. I think the, the two comparisons, like you mentioned that it is a torch, and the important thing to remember about a torch is that it costs one. And so it costs are, one and it's a fast spell, so yeah. torch is... Yeah. There's a lot of nice pieces of text on this card, but it is five. I think the more re realistic card to compare it to is Mithril Mace. 
uh, where that's what, four for a four three. Um, and so we're paying an extra one to have the opportunity for the choice. And you're right, the bit that's really impressive with it is the fact that it can increase, uh, more importantly, I think the health of a pre-existing weapon. A lot of weapons in Eternal are basically one hit kills in Limited. Uh, most creatures have a health of four or less. The ability to get a second or a third use out of it, especially in Justice where we do have a lot of these weapon synergies, uh, you have the ability to pump up a lot of your weapons already. I have the suspicion that again, um, I see this more down the bottom of the C range. It's a card that I'll be happy to have one of. I'm not sure if I'd ever want more than two. Oh Lord, no. I don't um, think you'd ever want even two. But yeah, it's... that's me trying to be yeah. generous. Um, and so the fact that it has a choice, that I think they're basically increasing the cost by one to, to give you that choice. It, they're actually not. Mithril Mace is a five cost, two justice loyalty, three, four weapon. Okay, I'll tell a so lie. So it's... Sorry, yeah, Master Google has come in and informed us. Um, so it's not that dissimilar to Mithril Maze. It's losing that one point of toughness, and it's one loyalty cheaper to cast. But I definitely agree with you. It, it's definitely around the mid-seas. You don't want really more than one, and I wouldn't be picking it early. It's one of those pack three, pack four, this shows up, and I've already got a bunch of relic weapons in my deck. Mm. Hey, I'd love to pick this up and see what fun synergies I can pull out. If I don't have weapons in my deck and this shows up, even if I'm in Justice, I'm going to be questioning what other removal I've got because five cost removal for something that likely if you're killing something with three toughness, it's got that three power to go with it. So yeah. you're getting a one-shot effect. It's going away straight away. So but Fourth health on the mace is really important. Uh, Very much so. For five cost, you're probably going to be killing something that costs about three. And the whole joy of Mithril Mace is that it can ideally do it twice uh, with Hone, depending on which scenario you're in. Uh, yeah, I, I suspect that this is one of those where it actually has a, a, both a higher ceiling and a higher floor than Mithril Mace. If we're looking early in the draft, I generally like to err uh, more on the side of Christmas than normal. <laughs> I do like to try and have the highest ceiling in some of my early cards and then build to it so I can try and ensure that we get into a festive mood. And so I think Home will be one that will definitely blow me out more times than I like <laughs> to admit throughout this limited format. Yeah, I think it's going to pop up occasionally, but it's not going to blow your socks off. Sweet art on it, too. Uh, yes. Yeah. Like, well, these are the tinkers. These are the the ones that will give you plus one, plus one to a unit or weapon in your hand. There's a nice world that's being crafted around us. Also in that world, we've got the Outlaws, and now we've got a Praxis Outlaw, which is a three-mana three-one, that at the end of your turn, if you have no cards in your hand, draw Praxis Outlaw from your deck. It's also a Mage Rogue. I don't know if these creature types are going to start affecting us but Cozzy what do you think about the outlaw? I'm torn uh, one health is a real problem uh, it basically means it can get blocked by drones it can get blocked by uh, scaly gruins as a 1-4 or a 1-5s and get invalidated very quickly uh, it is true that fire is the faction that wants to be running through the cards and to be able to draw something at the end of your turn uh, is not nothing but it's also at the end of your turn where you'll need to wait until next turn to cast your three drop. And thinking through how games of limited will normally play out, every time I've played Stone Scar or Arcano, I'm generally emptying my hand by about turn five and not that much earlier. And if that's the case, on turn five or six, picking up a three drop, three one that's likely to either, either in that scenario, I have a dominating board and I'm probably winning anyway, or my opponent is stabilized, I've emptied my hand and I'm thinning my deck a little bit to give me a better chance of drawing either my removal or uh, my combat trick, but not by much, or I'm getting a 3-1 that's probably just going to get bricked on the board anyway. And so, yeah, whilst the art is sweet, I don't think the card is quite as sweet as it, just because the, the scenarios that I can imagine having a benefit for the Praxis Outlaw in Limited is relatively low. It's not as though you're going to be building Jito decks. Yeah, look, I, I completely agree with you. The guy has got a sick poncho, and I think that really <laughs> should start to try and push towards the grade. But he's a 3-1 that only synergizes if you've got more of him in your deck. So not only are you going to have to pick a very underwhelming 3-mana three or 3-cost three 3-1, three you're also going to then have to pick up another 1 or 2 or 3 just to take advantage of its ability. Its ability requires it to live on the board, this is a 3-1. This is going to trade with almost every other one-cost creature in the game. So it's not surviving very well. Um, it's not something that I'm going to look at and in any time be excited by. I'm, I'm really quite underwhelmed because on top of that, you've got, I believe it's the Pyro Adept is a 2-cost 3-1. Yep. 
I'm going to be prioritizing that. It's one cost lower. It's getting out on the board earlier. Whereas the Praxis Outlaw, on top of everything else, is going to be a bit of a lightning rod. If your opponent plays one, you may be thinking, hmm, this creature is something that they might have another one of. So if they're attacking into me, and I've got a one cost one one on the board, yeah, I'll go for the trade. Because my one cost one one is likely not going to have enough of an upside. And on the off chance that they're going to be able to draw another one from their deck, I'm going to shut that down. I'm going to stop that. This is definitely Mr. I Want to Eat Pavement. It is not something I'd ever be excited to put into my deck. I'll tell you what, mate. It gives me shivers when you say that we can make an opponent's one cost one one good in limited. Uh, that's, when, <laughs> that's when we're in the wrong, heading in the wrong direction. Uh, so overall, it looks as though in the hypothetical world where this is employed into limited... Uh, Hone and Quarry are probably the two that will have some kind of influence. I think Hone is definitely the best of the four uncommon cards that we've seen so far. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely in agreement. And yeah, Cliffside Porter and Praxis Outlaw. I mean, the Outlaw faces off well against the Porter, but that's about all it faces off well against. Too easy. Well, we've done the meat and potatoes. It's time to get into the dessert. And the thing that's important to notice with the rares and the legendaries is that they're not going to be coming up often. They're ultra splashy. Uh, they generally have well and truly above the curve power levels, as you've seen in the normal sets. And it's important to keep in mind that the two scenarios where you're going to be looking at getting either a rare or legendary is if you crack it in your first pack or if it's cycling around to you very late in the draft. And so I think they're the two lenses that we want to look through these, um, look look at these cards through. Absolutely. And Start look, I off... think within all of these, the thing to keep in mind is that most of them are powerful enough to want to be build arounds. Mm. So, yeah, no, please set us off. Let's start off with the beefcakes. Uh, so we have Shadowlands Feaster, which I think we're going to be seeing a fair amount of in Constructed, but as far as for Limited, it's a 7 cost 5-6. So on that alone, slightly under the curve, um, slightly, quite under the curve, uh, we're really hoping for some help uh, with the stats. So the creature has both Flying and Ambush, and when an enemy unit dies, it goes into your void. Clouded. Oh, look, I want to love this. I, I love this in Constructed. I think this is a control finisher that people have been waiting for. I think this could do a lot of really fun work. And there's a lot of synergies to go with things being in your vo void. We saw from Vara's, jo Vara's journey Vara's, Vara's, mm. Vara's journey that there was the Cabal Cultist, which loves things going into your void. I think it could be a great card if you have the ability to build around it. Look, 5-6 in the air. You're doing a lot of damage. Flying an ambush, you can definitely blow some people out. I like it. It's powerful. It really shines if you get the chance to pick the right cards around it, and I don't know that you're always going to see the cards. Often you'll get a draft go through where you won't see anything that's really going to affect your void. If you're playing this, you're wanting to play a lot of kill spells, but you're in shadow anyway. That's what you're going to be doing. And you are definitely, unlike other shadow decks, you'll be prioritizing things like your dread returns. Just so that you get the chance of, oh, my opponents attack me with their amazing bomb creature. I've managed to chump block it and somehow kill it. It goes to my void. And now, haha, for one cost, it is coming back into my hand. And I'm throwing it out there to laugh at them. Yeah, Dread Return is the card that I instantly think of as being um, the cookies and cream for this particular card. I do like the fact that it's got Ambush. I think that's significant. The fact that... Uh, when you get late into the game, and I can imagine once the board state is stalled or once we trade off resources and they top deck a 3-3 and attack in, thinking they can finally get the clock happening again, you can catch them out with this. But it is 7 cost, and we need to ask ourselves how often you cast a 7 cost creature. And the reality is for me, I know most of my decks, especially whilst limited as aggressive as it currently is, tick out at about 5 or 6. And so, yeah, I feel as though it's just a little bit too expensive for my taste. If I could pick it early, um, pick it speculatively, and see a whole bunch of Dark Returns and Removal, then yeah, of course, you're doing it. But that being said, if you have a Shadow deck that has a whole bunch of Dark Returns and Removal, you're doing it anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I think this would be the kind of card that when I feel like having a bit of fun, um, I'll be picking <laughs> early and seeing how we go. But yeah, I think uh, something to, to keep in mind as well, Hunting Terry Axe does see play. Mm. It's a little bit cheaper. But it's also got a much weaker hind end. So I can definitely see the Shadowlands Feaster seeing play and doing some really nasty things. Yeah, but the cheaper bit is the bit that The makes cheaper me bit does make it a lot nicer. A fair monk. A fair amount happier. I suppose. <laughs> Jack, the bounty hunter, is slightly cheaper, costing six uh, for a 6 4 in Ricano colours. And this is a quick draw unit, and it has the ability upon summoning to silence and stun an enemy unit. Now, this is what I'm in the market for. 
Uh, a six power unit with quick draw is nigh unkillable uh, in normal combat. Uh, good luck trying to get it off the board. Mm. And importantly, it passes the torch test, unlike our other friend who has six power and quick draw, which makes it much more difficult for your opponent to deal with. And when I'm spending six power, I want to make sure I can get value out of my creature, even if my opponent has removal. And that's precisely what this does. It both silences and stuns an enemy unit. The stun gives it a great opportunity of getting in damage. Uh, and the silence basically means we can invalidate a lot of problematic creatures. I feel as though the, the, the health and the power is ever so slightly down on what I'd want for six, but having quick draw and the summon ability just pushes it way over the top. And so I can very much understand why this gunslinger is a legendary creature. Uh, this is something that Whilst ordinarily I am cautious to select double influence creatures early, I'd be slamming this. Oh, um, absolutely. And look, Ricardo's an incredibly strong colour. If you can find yourself in Ricardo colours, in draft, and it comes through to your seat, you are happy regardless, because the combination is just strong. And then getting a finisher like this, getting the high end of your curve, you wouldn't want anything else really up there. Um, Ricardo decks struggle if they've got too much around the 6 and 7 cost. Um, but the one guy up at six, he lands on the board, you're able to invalidate their best creature for at least a turn, possibly entirely by removing its abilities, and then on the next turn, you are not blocking with this, because the last thing you want to do is get blown out by a combat trick, um, and I think that's something to keep in mind, that someone attacks in, your quick draw's not activating, they then power out a finest hour, and you are just hurting, but as soon as you start getting on the aggressive with Jack, you're happy. You're in a really happy spot. Your opponents are going to have to two-for-one it and chump block at the same time. It's it's a nice place to be, and I do quite like Jack for that in Limited. You like the finest hour. I'd like to rampage. Putting overwhelm on this is disgusting. <sighs> that would be beautiful. All right, last <laughs> of the legendary creatures. We have Nyctotraxian. I'm glad you pronounced it, because I can't. <laughs> Nyctotraxian is a seven-cost unit that requires one colour of each faction to give you an 8-8 flying dragon with a fate ability of create and draw a random card when you draw him. What do you think about this this giant flying beefcake, Cozzy? Yeah, so this is where I have my two lenses for analysis. Uh, if this is something that comes through to me in pack 3, pack 4, I'm never playing it because the likelihood of me having the rainbow colours available is next to zero. I feel bad enough if I have to splash a second colour, let alone one. And so, yeah, it's Stone Cold unplayable in that scenario. It'll be something that you'll value pick so you can have it for Constructed or because you like dragons. I think where this card gets interesting is if you get it in pick one, pack one. Oh, absolutely. And you have the chance to look at it and wonder what you want to do because, hey, let's, let's go through the vanilla test. Seven cost, eight, eight, brilliant. Uh, With relevant abilities, yeah. yeah. Excellent. And plus draw a card. So as I was saying before, if I can make sure I get value even if my opponent has removal, excellent. The way that I would make this card work is if I were to draw this pick one, pack one, I think I would be drawing every stranger I come across. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure quite how high, but I'd be wanting to make sure I could fix those influences as fast as possible. And I could still foresee scenarios where I'll probably have it languishing in my hand and not get away with it. Oh, absolutely. But at the top of a stranger theme deck, oh yes. Uh, I'd have quite a lot of fun if I was trying to play competitively i still think i'll be dubious if i have a decent piece of removal in the uncommon slots i suspect i'll probably pick those over it yeah completely understandable look it's it's one of those cards when you're flush with gold you're sitting there looking at the card options in pick one pack one and you need to make the decision am i trying to level up here am i trying to climb the ladder or are we just going against the wall and having as much fun as we possibly can nictotraxian having the abilities that he has is a bit of a a bit of a false lead um, it's a bit of a tease. Odds are you're not getting this card out. What I'd be doing, absolutely agreeing with you, Cosy, a stranger theme is a place to go. The other thing I'd be looking at is possibly going for some kind of an Elysian shell. If you're mm. definitely getting into your cards to draw it and then put it back on top of your library, if you've got ways of, like with your nesting Aversaur, yes, you'll put it back on top of your deck, it'll be drawn again, you're still no close. If it's a five cost, needs the rainbow colours. You're still no closer to playing no. it, but you are creating and drawing a random card each time Nick Dotraxian hits your hand. So I think that's probably where I'd go. Also within that, if you're getting into time colours, you're more likely to be able to get things like, I believe it's the Copper Acolyte? Amber Acolyte. Amber Acolyte, which yep. allows you Super to... Power and, yep. 
Exactly. Seek power on a creature. And then as soon as you start getting that, prioritizing seek powers, prioritizing strangers, you're then getting at a point where you may one day be able to cast him. That said, a dangerous place to be in is to be building a deck that's all revolving around having that one card out of the 45 that you hope will see your hand in order to allow you to abuse it. Which is why my tendency would probably be to move towards an Elysian build and then see if we've got ways of making a strong Elysian deck that can fill its way out to the other three colours and take advantage of, if not playing Nyctotraxian, drawing him multiple times. And that way I can draw a whole bunch of humbugs. Woo! Random cards. <laughs> and you guys can have a lot of fun watching me lose it. Oh, Cozzy is just laying on the floor of the basement here, <laughs> making dirt angel. It's cool down here. <laughs> Alrighty, into the rares. So we get to look at bait. Five cost, one one. Blah. <laughs> Fortunately, there's more. It has the entombability of play a 7-7 seven, seven Steelbound Dragon with Flying and Overwhelm. Now, I can instantly think of all the constructed decks where I want to have fun with this. Oh, but yes. in Limited, where do you stand, Clouded? In Limited, look, I'm not incredibly happy. Effectively, what you're finding yourself with is a creature with Deadly. This is definitely an upside. And so it's not... The worst? I'd say give it an average rate. But if you compare this, say, to your Shadow Spider, it's one cost, it's got deadly, people don't want to attack in because they don't want to trade a creature with it. In a similar situation, you've got bait on the field. Whatever creature they have, so long as it's not 7-7 seven, seven or higher, they're not going to want to attack because as soon as they do, you chump block with bait and then you've got 7-7 seven, seven flyer with overwhelm and they're in a difficult situation having to answer it. Mm. If they've got an answer for it, Sure, they'll attack in, you get the dragon, they then play a kill spell and they're chuckling away, but you're still drawing out the kill spell. I like it, it's definitely a combat deterrent. Um, the place you don't want to be in with it is much like you get with your late turn or late game ticking grenadines, where you play the creature, it's the one mana one one that when it dies deals three to the face. You play that in the late game and your opponent goes, I can take one damage for four turns in a row before I'm at a worse situation than if I do just chump block this creature once. So tell you what, come in and punch me for one. And if you pay a five mana 1-1 one, one that keeps on slapping you, your opponent in the face, you're going to be crying about that. That's not a good place to be in. Okay, this is interesting, because this is where I'm actually quite a bit higher than you okay. on my assessment of it. Um, the way that I see it is, if I get this early in a draft, I'm not seeing this as a five cost with double fire. I'm seeing this as a five cost with a double fire and a shadow. Uh, this yep. is basically going straight into my Stone Scar builds where I'm going to be playing things uh, like Devour. Combust. Yeah. yeah, Combust. All of those kind of cards where I can use this on curve and in the way I want to use them. Um, it, it doesn't fit into your natural fire archetype. You're right. That whole idea of having a defensive creature that bullies people into not wanting to attack. But the fact that Stone Scar is your color combination that abuses this whole mechanic of killing creatures for benefit... I think this, this will be quite strong in it. I don't think it's necessarily fantastic. It's a bit uh, in the same way that I analyzed the 0-2 Gargoyle. I feel as mm. that's fine, but the difference with that is it comes down early and prevents attacks. This is much more of that aggressive style of being able to get your combust off or things like that. Um, and so I quite like it. I feel as though it's the... Uh, Stone Scar's not a color I have issues being in. Absolutely. I, I no, quite look, like it. Yeah, I can definitely respect that. And I'll agree with you, yeah. Put it in Stone Scar. I think the difference when you're looking at something like the Gargoyle, the Gargoyle can work in Stone Scar or in Film Colors, whereas I think with Bait, you're in Stone Scar. It's true. Yeah, it's a double color card straight off the bat. And I don't think I'd be too interested in playing it in any other color combination other than Stone Scar. But a 7-7 seven, seven with Flying and Overwhelm is just the finisher that you need, especially if you've been able to use your Combust to kill whatever blocker they have. Um, and... Even things like your 3-3 three, three, that wants to kill a creature and get bigger. I see a lot of scenarios in these particular colour combinations where you're quite happy to see it. Yeah, and so this absolutely. would be the kind of thing that um, <laughs> would possibly even draw me into a colour. If I've picked a couple of shadow cards early and I see this come through pick three, I'd be quite tempted. No, I can absolutely agree with that. Okay, let's move on to the Passage of Eons. This is a six cost, double time requirement spell that silences all enemy units, kills all enemy attachments. What do you think, Cozzy? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, if I want to spend my entire six turn doing something, 
I want to have an impact beyond killing a couple of attachments. Uh, if we're leaving three creatures on the board and they're silenced and I'm about to take nine damage because they're three, four, and five drop <laughs> adds, this is not a harsh rule. This is more expensive than a harsh rule. It doesn't deal with creatures in the same way of harsh rule. And how often do you have enemy attachments that you really care about in limited? Uh, occasionally you have the bomb ones that totally blow you out, but most of those are at rare. Like the number of times you see the really impressive relic weapons or the really impressive well relics, I can't. I can count yeah. them on one hand from the last two weeks of playing. <laughs> Absolutely. And look, if you factor in that it's killing enemy weapons as well that are attached to units, I mean, so? I'd If given the opportunity between a way of killing the creature or destroying the weapon, I want to kill the creature. I'm prioritising hard removal over this. I think the card to compare this to, and it does not compare favourably to, is Striking Snake Formation. Striking Snake Formation is a 5 mana 2 loyalty that gives all of your units killer which is effectively a board wipe, but a selective board wipe and you can keep things around. Game controlling card. Does mm -hmm. amazing things. Whereas by comparison, this is one cost more and does pretty little. If they don't have a unit with an ability that you want to silence, it does nothing. If they don't have any attachments, it sits in your hand and glares at you. These, yeah. are, these are just not happy things. This is the passage of Eons because it'll take me that long before you see me play it. Oh, oh, welcome to the pun and welcome to the segue. I like it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> hibernating Behemoth. Uh, 7 cost 4-4. Four, four. Uh, double time again. And this is a dinosaur, which is going to become ever more important in Constructed, but not so much in Limited. And it has the fate ability that happens immediately where it gets plus 2, plus 2, and you gain 2 health. Uh, when I see a card like this, I instantly think of Elysian. I yeah. instantly oh. think of Shenanigans, putting it back on the top of the deck, drawing additional copies. And I think that in that scenario, I'd be quite happy having this as a one-off on the top of my deck to try and make extra copies of or to have a saw down nice and cheap. And the uh, it's, it, it seems like Attack Online that you gain two health, but I think that's actually significant. Elysian is not an aggressive deck. Um, unless you happen to have that real front foot flies deck, but more often than not, it's much more just value creatures in mid-range and overwhelm you towards the end. And so the ability to keep ticking up just a bit of health each time you can activate the fate, I think is quite attractive indeed. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you on any part of that. I think the only thing that, that does wear me down with this a little bit, like gaining the two life is nice. The inevitability of this creature getting better and better and better is also nice. But... The thing that I've found with the Elysian decks where I'm constantly putting things on top of my deck is that I am just redrawing that card. Yep. And so you are effectively getting a form of card disadvantage in that you're redrawing a card that you didn't play before and you're possibly not playing now and you're wanting possibly to replay or redraw it again and again. Mm -hmm. Unlike something like the amazing legendary Nyctotraxian where you're getting some kind of value and additional card advantage by doing so, the Hibernating Behemoth doesn't really give me anything that I'm excited for. If I had a card that was zero cost, gain two life, I wouldn't include it in my limited deck. That's fair. And although this eventually will become something better, and it is just straight up a seven cost, six, six, that will gain you two life, and that's nice, I'm not amazingly excited for it. it it's something that I'd likely pick unless there was a really solid uncommon. And in my second and third draws, or even in my second pack... It's something that could I could, could easily shift away from a colour, and I wouldn't be saying, oh, I need to stay with time because I have this hibernating behemoth. Uh, let's face facts. If I had this or a Pillar of Amara, I'd take the Pillar of Amara any day. Oh, yeah, hands down. Yeah. Hands down. Solid card, but nothing to write home about. This, however, is a card that I'm excited <laughs> about oh, in both and formats. And some. Yeah, this is the card that makes me wish that <laughs> this actually gets um, put into the limited format because I'd have so much fun with it. Copper Hall Bailiff. It's a three cost two three with double green, which is important because it does make it a little bit trickier to cast in limited on turn three. But the upsides. Uh, it has Warcry, <laughs> so we instantly know what kind of archetype we're putting that into. And it has a summon ability because, you know, a 3 cost 2 3 with Warcry, that's not quite good enough. We, we ha already have the 3 cost 3 3 uh, that goes across the Rakana colors. So, what else do we get? All enemy units get minus 1 power. Clouded, why is that so pertinent? Oh, because that means you can keep attacking in with your creatures with Warcry. Yep. You are not ever having to worry about losing your um, Copper Hall Paladin. 
against another 2-2 because all of their 2-2s are now 1-2s and you're just in a very happy place. As we were saying with the last card, it's nothing to write home about. This is something I'm not writing home about. I'm taking it home to meet my parents. (laughs) I may be valuing this too high, but look, 2 Justice is difficult to get by turn 2, but people still will play things like your um, Silence Unit, your uh, Valkyrie Enforcer, Yep. um, which... Again, excellent card, no doubt to it. This is not quite that, but in a Warcry deck, you're getting the Warcry triggers, you're making everything your opponent's played till now worse. Late game, if you're in a board stall situation, you can just make their entire board weaker. Mm -hmm. If you've been eyeing off each other in a Cold War, suddenly you can attack profitably. I love this, and I'm wanting to get as many of them as possible to put into constructed decks, and if it's coming into limited... I'm going to be a happy camper to pick it and try and make it work in new combinations. I'd be interested to see what this could do outside of Ricardo, um, because I do think that's where it wants to be. But it's a solid enough card. I'd be interested to see if there are other combinations that may start to come open now to us with solid justice creatures that could possibly splash into other colours. Yeah, I can see it in a a slightly slower uh, combo build that's using weapons. Uh, the whole idea is, as you said, once you're in a stored ball state, to be able to reduce the power of all your enemy units to start to open up profitable attacks is important. Uh, but yeah, no, the the real um, the sugar on top is the fact that this is exactly what Warcry wants. Warcry is probably one of the more powerful keywords in oh. Eternal, but it's always conditional on you being able to attack. And so the fact that the summon ability facilitates attacking is exactly oh. what you want in a card. Yeah, hands down. So next up, we have Tyrannize, or Tyrannize. It's one of those plays on the word. Um, Four cost for two primal, transform a unit into a 5-5 Carnosaur. And now when I first saw this, I definitely underrated it because there's one important key part that I ignored, which is that last little bit on the bottom, fast spell. Oh, yeah. Cozzy, how does that change this card up into something you're actually going to want to play? You attack with a 3-3, I block with a 2-2. It becomes a 5-5, I'm happy. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very simple. Um, something on top of that to keep in mind, I know it's more expensive, but in Primal, it's effectively a Finest Hour. If I attack with a 2-2 and you chuckle to yourself with your mighty 4-4, ah, I'll just block this and eat it. You can't have anything. You're in the wrong colours. I can have something. I can have a 5-5 Dinosaur. And it is going to eat your puny 4-4. Mwah ha 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 ha. Yeah, it is significantly more expensive, but it's important to note that this is a permanent transformation. And so... In comparison to Finest Hour, that is a powerful thing. It's opportunity to get evasive damage in. If you have a flyer, they can't block the flyer, and you're able to cast it after they've declared the blocks. You'll be able to get your extra damage in with, say, your 2-1. So, plenty of opportunities with this card. Uh, I think they've costed it pretty fairly, to be honest. I think at 3, it would be bananas. And I think (laughs) at 5, I'd struggle to find a justification to play it because it would just be that bit too expensive. Because I'd want a 5-5 five, five for 5 anyway to have to expend one of my creatures. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you're in an absolute pinch, it can turn their 6-4 Overwhelm Flyer into a 5-5 five, five ground creature that you can chump block. That's a fantastic point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah. they play something ridiculous and bomby. I mean, there are even going to be situations where if for whatever reason they've managed to get someone like um, Seraph, who mm-hmm. late game is just going to be churning out creatures as a 3-4 Overwhelm, Saying to them, you know what, I'd rather you have a 1-5-5 five, five creature that I can deal with than a 3-4 that can constantly gain you card advantage. Yeah, I'm playing this and saying, have a dinosaur. Yeah, we started the show talking about how nice it is to have choice in a card. Mm. And that's precisely what Tyrannize, I think, is how I'm going to choose to pronounce it, provides. <laughs> so, yeah, it's slightly expensive, but I feel as though I'd be very happy putting it in a deck. And I'd probably be picking it quite aggressively. And if I saw this come through, yeah, say... Uh, picks two, three, or four, that'd be the first strong indicator for me. The mm. blue is open, and I'd start to very seriously think about shifting into those colours. Absolutely. And on top of which, it gives you a dinosaur. Guys, dinosaurs. Come on. <laughs> Happiness for the flavour win. Uh, Stray into Shadow is a five-cost spell. It's not a fast spell, and all units get minus four health. This is the kind of board wipe that I am happy to buy into. Oh, so much. So much. This is... It's not harsh rule. So it's not unilateral destruction of everything. But those things that survive straying into shadow are not going to be happy. And suddenly you're in a situation where you can attack profitably with your 1-1s, with your 2-2s, because their 5-5 is now a 5-1. And they're not wanting to block. They're not able to attack. On top of which, 
if they are playing a deck that can get things back, that can use Haunting Scream or Dread Returns, odds are, with hitting that magical four mark, those creatures aren't coming back. There's no way of getting them back, and that is a brilliant thing for a card. I am I am all into Straight Into Shadow. I think in some ways, we've been talking in the past about control decks not really seeing the love in Limited in Eternal, and I think if you crack something like this open, pick one, pack one, you're well on your way to having a really nice Feln control deck that can do some beautiful work. Yeah, Feln are exactly the colours I think of here, because granted these are all rares, but when you think of cards that define Feln control, they're all three fives. And so this then actually has some utility where it could be more valuable than Harsh Rule because if you're playing with those creatures and you're building around it knowing that you need to get the X5s into your deck, you can actually start to still have creatures on the board to to respond after you've cast your Strange Shadow to attack in. And so Felon is exactly where I think you'd be seeing this. Um, and so in comparison to our board wipe before, this is what cleans the board and gets you value and allows you to catch up once your opponent has started to to gain some kind of board advantage against you. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a massive fan. Yeah, I think this is possibly one of the strongest rares to come out. Mm, I agree with that. Combray Emissary. Now, you were getting excited about this before we turned on the camera, <laughs> so, Cloud, I'm going to leave this one over to you. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so it's a three-cost Combray Color 2-2, where you can play an additional power each turn. Now, I'm excited for it constructed. I think Big Combray is going to be very, very happy to see this card oh, come through. Yeah. In Limited, I'm very torn. I'm interested to see how it's going to go. It's one of those cards where, at turn three, you may still have one or two sigils in your hand. And being able to go, turn three, sigil, this creature, sigil, if you've got a one-drop, fine. If not, you're at four. You've just accelerated past your opponent. If you then draw another sigil or another two sigils, it can go crazy. The problem is that you've not got the ability to get the additional sigils unless you've got a great way of building around. And again, if you're building around this, there are other cards that you'll be wanting to get to get those sigils into your hand. There's the three mana, sorry, three cost green card that gives you two justice sigils into your hand. Things like that give you a chance to really accelerate out to get to those bigger creatures sooner. The only downside is you're still not in the colours for mass card draw. So I'm not sure if it's going to be an advantage to your opponent seeing that you're out of cards. I'm, I'm a bit torn about it in Limited. I love it in Constructed, but Limited I'm just I'm uncertain. Cosy, what's your, your expert mind tell us about this? Yeah, I'm not a fan of either being an expert mind or this card. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't love it. Uh, three cost two two. It's going to die to any bear that people play on turn two. Uh, indeed, it can even die to a time card where you're playing your adventurer that's a two three. And so as far as the way that actually impacts the board, I think that impact is negligible. Uh, so let's look at the ability then and think through the likelihood of limited games where after turn three, I have several pieces of power in my hand. They're probably either when I'm flooded out and so getting out that power isn't going to be too useful unless I draw into a very expensive creature and there are risks involved with actually putting very expensive creatures into your deck. Or I'm probably going to be able to use it once, slightly skip ahead of my opponent, and it's just like playing the 1-1 Mana Dork, uh, which isn't a card that I'll normally want in Limited at all. That's fair. I think the other thing that we can use as an analysis for this is looking at the colour combination that we've got, something that's definitely prevalent, is the Empower ability. Mm. And so, on a off chance, if there's some way that you've built a hyper-aggressive, low-curve Combray deck, playing Turn 1 District Infantry, Turn 2 District Infantry... Turn three, Combray Emissary, dump it down, you've played two, and those District Infantries are massive and you're closing the game out. Yes, I'm talking, like, we're not just putting the tinsel up here, we are erecting a 50-foot Christmas tree in the town square and there are pageants around. Yep, yep, yep. However, in those types of situations where you're trying to abuse the Empower mechanic, there's potentially something to be said for it. And only in as much as mid-game, if you've got Empower creatures in your deck, there are situations where you've hit that five-power limit and you're then just storing those power in your hand mm. so that in the late game you can take a creature like district infantry or even something like the civic peace master dump down your six drop and stun two creatures however it is definitely worth saying that in that situation you're already behind if you're stalling playing out cards in your hand while flooding on the off chance you draw something that might get you back in the game that's not a position i want to be in in my mind state when i'm building the deck in the first place Look, even hearing about Christmas, which is... Yeah, it's going to happen one day out of the year. Um, 
Give me a Combray Healer any day. Yeah, hands down. Give me an Adventure any day. I'd much rather those. I think the best you can hope for with this is to get yourself uh, one of the monks and to trigger off on that. But the, the, the likelihood of you having the power in your hand to be able to gain a benefit from this card is still exceptionally low. And once you get to the point, once you've cast all your power, that's your one hit benefit, you're still only going to be casting one power a turn. Yeah. Um, you might get Seek the Ways or things like that, and then plausibly, this could get more valuable, but... Yeah. More often than not, in Limited, you're at turn 6, drawing a 3 cost 2-2, two, two, and kicking the heavens for actually putting it in your deck in the first place. Yeah, we're stretching to redeem rather than finding the actual qualities. If this was a 3 cost 3-3, three, three, no worries, because it's worth it on its vanilla stats, but as a 2-2, two, two, it just does not do remotely enough for me. The Avasaur Patriarch. So... 4 cost 2-4, and it's worth noting that the influence cost on this one is high. You need both 2 time and also 2 primal, and the likelihood of getting that in turn 4 in a game of limited is relatively low. So I think it's more realistic to think of this as a 5 cost, where uh, potentially, occasionally, you'll get it in earlier. So we have a 2-4 four fly for 4, which I think is about right. I'd be not too unhappy with that deal. It can block your 3-1 flyers. It can block your 2-1s. So it's useful in that regard. And at 4 health, it blocks a lot of things. So I'd be quite happy with... Relatively happy, at least. If the influence cost was uh, lower, then I'd be very happy to put this in the deck. Because this is stone cold. You're playing it in Elysian and nothing else. The second bit is what makes it interesting. So your dinosaurs, first of all, cost one less. And there are a fair number of dinosaurs that are coming through. Um, I've been surprised how many things I thought were bats or, <laughs> or other creatures that are actually dinosaurs or lizards. There's a lot of dinosaurs in the Eternal World. Yeah, and I love me a Lord deck. I play Tribal a lot in Magic. Um, granted, in Rare, you're probably only going to be getting one of these in Limited. Um, sure. But the bit that I really quite like about it is the fact that it has an ultimate ability where you can pay six to give your dinosaurs plus two, plus two. Now, the reason why I like ultimate abilities is it operates as a power sink. And what I mean by that is when you have spare power sitting around, perhaps because you've run out of cards in hand, this allows you to still utilize your power to, uh, to get some kind of benefit. And even in the worst case scenario with the Avasaur Patriarch, where it's your only dinosaur on the table, you can still pay six to turn it into a 4-6 fly, which is a beefcake, a bona fide beefcake. But if you happen to have other dinosaurs on the table, it gets better and better. And the reason why I like Power Sync so much is because we have three scenarios in a limited game. You'll have your normal games where both of you power out normally, you get to do your thing and you have a great game. You have scenarios where you or your opponent are power screwed and one of you doesn't get to do too much. And then you'll also have the scenarios where either you or your opponent are power flooded. And this allows me to mitigate one of those scenarios to some degree. And so I'm always looking out for cards that allow me to utilize my power in ways other than just casting a card precisely because of that last scenario. It allows me to mitigate one of those scenarios that may well otherwise be an automatic loss for me. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it, in a way you can think of it as additional card advantage. It is a card in your hand that you draw when you play the Avisor Patriarch yeah. that says cast only while you control Avisor Patriarch. Pay six, dinosaurs get plus two, plus two. Yeah, so, yeah, it means that the next turn, if you draw a power, you're not kicking yourself. Because, hey, that odds are means if you played this on five, you're now up at six. Boom! Dinosaurs get bigger. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think I would ever first pick this, though. Uh, no? Even in a super weak pack, because committing that heavily to Elysian has me quite nervous. Uh, I think it's the kind of thing where later on I'd be willing to pick it from picks three to five or so. But it really is. This is more than just a double color combination. This is locking in. It's not as though when you pick something that um, has one pip of each influence, you can then go, well, I could even be off that color a little bit and then splash in. This is you are Elysium with a capital E. And so that's the one thing that makes me nervous if this was a world where we could be uh, seeing this in a draft. You sound as though you're on a different page? I'm possibly on a different page. I mean... Look, it's one of those cards that if you do pick it early, you can definitely prioritise. You'll be keeping an eye out for your Hatchling Patriarchs, mm. so Terriax. Um, Scaly Gruen is a dinosaur. There's a lot of the dinosaurs. Which one, sorry? False Prince, just False straight in those colours, yeah. Yep, exactly. There's it's a, a lot of gross cards. Three drop, four it's drop, an isn't excellent it? colour. <laughs> um, and so it's definitely something that I'd be interested in. Um. And I think, yeah, you've got the potential to build around it. I think the other thing to keep in mind is Explorer Emeritus, 
I believe the name is, yep. is the five cost, same requirement for a zero one exhaust to draw a card. And I know I first picked that before. Now, that may be a mistake, yep. but that kind of card advantage, I, I like the yep that it oh, may no, be that was me acknowledging what you were saying. Be, yep, that is a mistake. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's definitely a card that allows you to carry away with the game. You can run away with the game with the Explorer because you're getting a lot of card advantage and you're getting through your deck. Likewise with the Patriarch, you are, if you're constructing a deck around it, you're getting a lot of advantage and it's definitely a colour combination that's fantastic. It would have to be a weaker pack because a strong uncommon, if I'm opening this and I'm looking at this or Death Strike, oh, yeah, I'm picking Death Strike. Yeah. It's... And someone down the line may speculatively pick it at third or fourth pick and then be very happy to find that they're in that seat. But you're right. If I do first pick this and find myself in a seat where those two colours are not flowing through to me, I'm going to have a few feel-bads because I'm missing that powerful first pick and getting a first pick tasty bit of removal, yeah, okay, it's going to be better. But in those weaker packs, I'm honestly going to be happier grabbing the Patriarch and going, you know what? It, it's one of those things we were talking about with Nyctotraxis that... Nyctotraxis? Nyctotraxian. I'm Nyctotraxian. leaving that up to you, mate. I'm not going near that one. <laughs> I'm just going to keep on making it up as I go. But with Nyctotraxian, it's one of those, you're looking at it and you know that you're in for a crazy ride if you're going to try and make it work. With the Patriarch, I feel like if the Nyctotraxian is up at 11, Patriarch's pulling it right back down to a 5 or 6 on the crazy scale. Yes, it's still crazy, but I can realistically see myself forcing an Elysian deck that I can still make quite strong, and there'll be a few iffy picks. It's not a card that I'm going to splash, and you're right, as the seat moves, I may be very quickly moved out of it, but I think, on top of everything, it's it's a Dinosaur Lord. Cosy. <laughs> Cosy, I, I don't know what your hesitation is. It's a Dinosaur Lord. I don't... I don't see the downside. Look, mate, I respect your tra Spinal Trap reference more than the Dinosaur Lord argument. <laughs> uh, going back on the uh, Explorer Emeritus, I think the important thing to note is that he costs five, which means it's much more reasonable to be casting him with those influence costs. Sure. And the other thing is drawing a card versus pumping up dinosaurs is a very different ability. And so I, I think I overspoke. Uh, I don't think it's <laughs> going to be a case where I never draw, uh, take this first pick. You're right. There can definitely be weak packs where... I'd rather this over a basic common creature that's value. Um, and to try and see just how high the ceiling can go, because if you end up in Elysian, then this card's phenomenal. Just imagine this combining with nesting avasaurs and things like that. Oh, uh, it could get gross very, very quick. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's the one criterion that I'll be thinking through in my head. And this will be one of the things where um, we use the adage of not getting too wedded to your first pick. Th this will be the reason why I dropped this first pick quickly. Yeah. Is if I don't see the colours coming through, I don't feel comfortable splashing this at all. Absolutely. In a lot of ways, you always need to look at your second pack, and if the colours aren't there, pretend that you haven't drafted it. Yeah, very much so. And to finish us off... Oh, we've got a Cabal Spymaster. Four influence... Sorry, four cost with uh, Feln influence for a 4-4 four, four Cabal Spymaster. Your units can infiltrate any number of times. Cosy. What's that do for us? It makes me think of Lothrari Ranger. That's what it does for me. <laughs> oh, upside is huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whilst ordinarily I do enjoy Lothrari Ranger a little bit much more in Stone Sky, I realise that I'm not the norm in that. A lot of the other experienced drafters do prefer it much more in a Felon Aggro deck uh, because I love rampaging my Rangers. <laughs> but, yeah, look... Whilst when you're playing an aggressive film deck, you're probably praying for infiltrate creatures. That's what defines it. Uh, that's where you get your plus two, plus twos, or kill target creature, or you're um, sacrificing it and drawing cards and gaining life, although this one doesn't help too much in that particular scenario. Uh, it's a four cost, four four. Yeah. Vanilla test wise, it is strong. There's nothing wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and if you manage to get one upside off it, it goes from being strong to amazing. And so, yeah, the Spy Master is something that I will be so stoked to see. Absolutely. Um, it's not going to, on its own, win you the game, but it, if you have the opportunity to build around it and if those ranges are open... Um, like, rangers are a bomb on the play anyway. Uh, yeah. they're, they're phenomenal to begin with. To allow them to continue to pump up. Like, one of my favourite things to do with a ranger is attack in, turn it to 4-4, trade off, let it die, and dark return it back. This doesn't even cost the card. Yeah, It just allows absolutely. it to keep getting in if you're able to. If you can get some kind of overwhelm on it, or if you can make it unblockable, yeah. Well, I think the other thing to keep in mind, because I know you're definitely 
definitely deeply in love with the Little Fry Rangers, and that's understandable because they're a solid card. Mm. What this does to me is it says, hey, and I know, again, we're still talking for that one card out of the 45, so you're still going to be a little bit hesitant, though you are in the colours of card draw, you're in the colours of scheme, in the colours of Wisdom of the Elders, you're potentially going to be even looking at Gorgon Fanatics in this. Mm -hmm. Gorgon Fanatics don't necessarily do well with the Spy Master because they sacrifice on Infiltrate, but as soon as you're getting into this in first pick, every other Infiltrate creature, now the Lothrai Rangers are great, but the Beetle, the, eh, look, it's okay, mm. suddenly becomes amazing. Because you land that early, and if you can start to repeat Infiltrate, it gets plus one attack while keeping as an air attacker every time it attacks. Your Desperado, card that I'm a little bit lukewarm on, because it's one of those, well, look, your opponent's got to block it, if they can block it, because if they can block it... I just see it as a removal spell. Yeah, Your it's a removal spell. Your opponent has to remove it and trade out. This suddenly turns the Desperado into a recurring removal spell. Mm. And that's fantastic. Let alone getting into your idea of Direwood Beastmaster. Yeah, I was thinking oh, Beastmaster Amulet baby. on some flying creature. Beastmaster Amulet becomes insane. Yeah. yeah, put on a flying creature on turn 3, drop the Cabal Spymaster on turn 4, and just get beast after beast after beast. Oh, so that's the, the Christmas land, but the bit that I love about this is even the day after when you've got a bit of a card coma, it's a 4 cost 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> yeah. And so there's absolutely nothing embarrassing about that. In um, a deck that traditionally won't have as many creature options available to it in your Feln removal aggro type of deck, this is a 4 mana 4-4. Four, four. Mm. Yeah, it's solid on its own without the ability and spectacular with the ability. i tell you what, the art is gorgeous on that. I love the shadow line across his face. It's definitely very cool. And you've got to wonder what's in that goblet. <laughs> I don't think we need to wonder at all. We know pain or joy, depending on what side of the, the axis you're on. Depending who's drinking. Yeah. Guys, I think that pulls us to the end of all campaign rewards available in Jack's Bounty. I... I... Bona fide hope that this does eventually get limited, uh, released into limited, just like the previous promos did. I think it would be quite fun to to splash things up a bit, uh, especially to have another wrath in another color with Strange Shadow. Mm, I absolutely. think it would make life quite interesting. Yeah, uh, feel free to let us know what you think of this analysis. Whether you think that this style of video is useful for you, uh, I have the suspicions. Like we've disagreed with each other, and I actually think that's at the heart of card analysis is talking through the subtleties of cards. Uh, most of these are just a couple of degrees away on our assessment and you may well have different scenarios that you can think through or different archetypes that you can see these cards fitting into that we haven't picked up on and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Look, is there a card that we've overvaluated or undervaluated? Please let us know. Although, if you think we've overvaluated the um, Avatar T Patriarch, you're wrong. You should feel bad about yourself <laughs> and you should build that Dinosaur Tribal Deck Unlimited the first chance you get. Don't worry, I control the comments on YouTube. I'll agree with you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, there you go, folks. I've been Cozzy and this has been Clouded Page doing our draft analysis video for Pick One, Pack One. I hope that this has been valuable for you and if you enjoy it, feel free to share it with your friends. Feel free to like, subscribe and all of those usual things that YouTube wants us to do. But I won't waste your time talking about it too much. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. It's been a lot of fun. I can't wait to do it for the next set that comes out. And until next time, I hope you guys have a good one. Bye.